Hi students of class 12. I welcome you all to this session. Last class, we have learned about the male reproductive system, spermatogenesis, that is formation of the male gamete and the structure of the mammalian sperm. Today, we will be learning about the female reproductive system, oogenesis, that is the formation of the female gamete and structure of the ovum. Now what are the parts of the female reproductive system? Here you can see a picture where the female reproductive system consists of a pair of ovaries. These are the two ovaries. As in male reproductive system there are a pair of testes. In female reproductive system you can see a pair of ovaries. Then comes the accessory duct. In female reproductive system the accessory ducts are the OV duct or the fallopian tube, uterus, cervix and vagina. All this come under the accessory ducts. And then comes the female genitalia. So these are the parts of the female reproductive system. It consists of a pair of ovaries. Then you can see the accessory duct which includes the fallopian tube. Then comes the uterus. Then cervix and vagina. Then external genitalia. So these are the parts of the female reproductive system. Now this ovary, there are a pair of ovaries and each ovary is covered by thin epithelium which encloses the ovarian stroma. The stroma is divided into two zones, outer cortex and an inner medulla. So there are a pair of ovaries, the ovary is covered by thin epithelium within which you can see the ovarian stroma which is divided into two zones, a peripheral cortex and an inner medulla. Next, accessory ducts. I already mentioned the accessory ducts include the OV duct of fallopian tube, uterus, cervix and vagina. So first you will learn about the OV duct. OV duct is otherwise called as a fallopian tube. This fallopian tube consists of three distinct regions. The first is the infundibulum, then comes the ampulla and then the isthmus. So here you can see the infundibulum. At one end of the infundibulum, you can see finger-like projections. These are called as the fimbriae. This fimbriae helps in collection of ovum after ovulation. Soon after ovulation, the ovum that is released is collected by the fimbriae. So infundibulum with finger-like projections called fimbriae. Next, it comes to a swollen region that is called as the ampulla. Infundibulum leads into the ampulla which is a swollen region. And this is followed by the isthmus. So these are the three parts of the OV duct. Infundibulum, ampulla, isthmus. Next is the uterus. The two OV ducts will lead into a single bag-like structure that is called as a uterus. The uterus consists of three distinct regions. The uterus consists of three distinct regions. Outer perimetrium middle myometrium and the inner endometrium. So these are the three distinct regions of the uterus. Perimetrium, myometrium and endometrium. This perimetrium consists of an outer thin membranous layer. Inner to the perimetrium you can see the myometrium. The myometrium is the middle layer and consists of smooth muscles which exhibit strong contractions during childbirth. So myometrium plays an important role in childbirth. The innermost layer is known as the endometrium. This endometrium is highly vascularized and supplied with glands, rich, highly glandular, richly glandular and undergoes cyclical changes during menstruation. So endometrium exhibit cyclical changes during menstruation. So myometrium play an important role during childbirth whereas endometrium plays an important role during menstruation. So the uterus consists of three distinct regions, outermost perimetrium, middle myometrium and inner endometrium. Endometrium play a major role during menstruation and myometrium plays a major role during childbirth. Next comes the external genitalia. This external genitalia consists of mons pubis, labia majora, labia minora and the clitoris. So Mons pubis is a cushion of fatty tissues covered by skin and pubic hair. Next comes the labia majora. These are fleshy folds of tissue which extends down from the Mons pubis and it surrounds the vaginal opening. The labia minora are paired folds of tissue under the labia majora. 
and the last one is clitoris which is a tiny finger like structure which lies at the upper junction of the two labia minora above the urethral opening so these are the parts of the external genitalia mammary glands are also a part of the female reproductive system there are a pair of glands that secrete milk each gland you can see around 15 to 20 mammary lobes and each lobe contains clusters of cells called alveoli alveoli are the milk secreting cells the alveoli then open into mammary tubules the tubules of each lobe join to form mammary duct several mammary ducts join to form a wider mammary ampulla this ampulla is connected to the lactiferous duct through which milk is sucked out so there are 15 to 20 mammary lobes each lobe contains milk secreting cells called alveoli the alveoli then open into mammary tubules several tubules will join to form the mammary duct several mammary ducts will join to form mammary ampulla which is then connected to the lactiferous duct through which milk is sucked out now next part is the oogenesis just like spermatogenesis oogenesis is the formation of the female gamete unlike spermatogenesis that starts only at puberty oogenesis begins during early embryonic stage when a child is born each fetal ovary has 2 million oogonia or gamete mother cells and no more oogonia are formed after birth so oogenesis is initiated during the early embryonic stage and when a child is born each fetal ovary has 2 million oogonia and no more oogonia are formed after birth oogonia then enter meiosis at the end of meiosis primary oocytes are formed but this meiosis is not completed it remains suspended at the prophase 1 stage of the meiotic division thus the primary oocytes are also deployed so oogonia will enter meiosis but the meiosis is not complete the division remains suspended at prophase 1 stage only if the division reaches anaphase stage haploid condition reaches but since the division is suspended at prophase 1 stage the primary oocyte is also deployed carrying 46 chromosomes the primary oocyte then gets surrounded by granulosa cells surrounding the primary oocyte the primary oocyte is deployed and is getting surrounded by a layer of granulosa cells and that stage is called as a primary follicle this primary follicle will degenerate during the phase from birth to puberty once a child reaches puberty of the 2 million oogonia there are only 60000 to 80000 primary follicles left in each ovary now this primary follicle gets further surrounded by granulosa cells and theca so once more primary oocyte which is deployed is getting surrounded by a layer of granulosa cells to form the primary follicle this primary follicle degenerate from birth to puberty and when a child reaches puberty there are only around 60000 to 80000 primary follicles in each ovary now what happens to this primary follicle the primary follicle surrounded by granulosa cells develop theca that stage is called as a secondary follicle so primary oocyte then next stage is the primary follicle primary follicle is actually the primary oocyte surrounded by granulosa cells and that primary follicle when it develops a theca around it that forms a secondary follicle and the secondary follicle the theca will differentiate to form a theca ex- externa and theca interna with a fluid filled cavity called antrum that stage is called as a tertiary follicle now the tertiary follicle containing the primary oocyte will complete its first meiotic division i already mentioned that meiosis is suspended at prophase 1 stage now the meiosis is completed first meiosis is completed but unlike spermatogenesis where the division is equal in oogenesis the division is unequal to form a large haploid secondary oocyte and a small polar body so this oocyte 
is haploid secondary oocyte is haploid and when the tertiary follicle matures to form a graafian follicle the secondary oocyte is released from the ovary by a process called ovulation now just see the stages the child is born with oogonia and that oogonia will differentiate to form the primary oocyte and the primary oocyte is also diploid because even though meiotic division takes place in the oogonia the division remains suspended at prophase 1 stage this is the reason why the primary oocytes are also diploid this primary oocyte gets surrounded by granulosa cells to form the primary follicle a large number of these follicles degenerate from birth to puberty as a result at puberty only 60000 to 80000 primary follicles are left in each ovary so this primary follicle is primary oocyte surrounded by the granulosa cells now this primary follicles get surrounded by a theca that stage is called as a secondary follicle so what a secondary follicle primary oocyte with the granulosa cells and the theca is called as a secondary follicle now this secondary follicle with the theca the theca will differentiate to form a theca externa and theca interna and a fluid filled cavity called antrum is seen that stage is called as a tertiary follicle now the primary oocyte within the tertiary follicle will complete its first meiosis but that division is unequal to form a large haploid secondary oocyte and a small polar body the secondary oocyte can complete its meiosis too only if fertilization takes place when the tertiary follicle matures to form a graafian follicle the secondary oocyte is released from the ovary by a process called ovulation so here you can see the schematic representation of oogenesis the oogonia which is diploid that will develop into the primary oocyte after meiosis 1 prophase 1 stage is suspended this primary oocyte will develop into the primary follicle then into the secondary follicle and then into the tertiary follicle and then it completes meiosis 1 at the end of meiosis 1 two unequal cells are produced one is a larger one is a secondary oocyte and a small polar body the chromosome number is reduced to half this secondary oocyte will be released at the time of ovulation further division can take place only if fertilization takes place so at the end of oogenesis only one ovum is produced and three polar bodies whereas at the end of spermatogenesis four sperms are produced now what is the structure of the ovum the secondary oocyte is remaining surrounded by a membrane called zona pellucida surrounding that membrane you can see the corona radiata granulosa cells called so corona radiata so that is the structure of the ovum ovum consists of a membrane that membrane is called as a zona pellucida and the cell surrounding it is called as a corona radiata so name the membrane surrounding the ovum the membrane surrounding the ovum is zona pellucida the cell surrounding the ovum that is the corona radiata now what is the difference between spermatogenesis and oogenesis spermatogenesis occur in the testis whereas oogenesis occurs in the ovary spermatogenesis begins only at puberty whereas oogenesis begins during early embryonic development in spermatogenesis the division is equal whereas in oogenesis the division is unequal at the end of spermatogenesis four haploid daughter cells or sperms are produced whereas at the end of oogenesis only one haploid daughter cell or ovum are produced